The story begins in Beijing in 1966, during a university protest where a physics professor named Yi Zetai faces public condemnation for his beliefs. His wife denounces him, and he's violently attacked by a young soldier while their daughter, Yi Wenji, watches helplessly. In the present day, Clarence she investigates the death of physicist Dr. Sadiq Muhammad, finding cryptic messages on the wall at the crime scene. Meanwhile, Dr. Vera Yi seeks Saul Duran's help at the Oxford Particle Accelerator, despite the program being shut down. Saul expresses doubts about science's ability to explain everything, causing Vera to question her beliefs before tragically taking her own life. Elsewhere, Jin Cheng and Augie Salazar, colleagues in the scientific community, discuss strange anomalies occurring in particle accelerator data. Augie experiences bizarre visual phenomena, signaling something is wrong. Suddenly, they receive a call from Saul, who tells Jin about Vera's suicide. Meanwhile, Clarence examines a board linking deceased scientists and their connections, including Jin, Augie, Saul, and others. Meanwhile, Will Downing and Jack Rooney, former colleagues now living different lives, discuss Jin's personal life amidst the turmoil. At the funeral, Jin reunites with her boyfriend Raj Varma, a military officer, while Saul's arrival hints at a past connection with Jin. They offer condolences to Vera's mother, and Augie arrives late, plagued by recurring numbers in her vision. Despite consulting doctors, the cause remains a mystery. Then, we see billionaire Mike Evans pay his respects before leaving, catching Clarence's attention as he secretly follows Evans to a helicopter. Afterward, the friends gather at a pub where Jack mentions Augie's successful company. Suspecting tension between Augie and Saul, Jack is unaware of Augie's struggles with the persistent numbers. During this, Augie encounters a mysterious woman outside who cryptically warns her about a countdown, offering a serial box decoder ring as proof. She tells her to look at the sky at midnight and the stars will wink at her. Then, she tells her not to let the countdown reach zero otherwise bad things will happen and after this, she disappears. Back in 1966 in Inner Mongolia, Wenji finds herself imprisoned in a labor camp. She forms a bond with Bay Mulan, a journalist, who shares a forbidden book with her. As their relationship deepens, Wenji grapples with environmental concerns and faces interrogation for possessing the book. Refusing to cooperate, she is taken to a mysterious facility where she is offered a choice to join them and remain there forever, or leave but never speak of what she saw. She chooses to stay, intrigued by the opportunity to use her talents. In present-day London, Clarence updates Thomas Wade on the case, sharing footage of Augie and Evans. Despite surveillance efforts, they can't trace Evans's destination. At Vera's house, Jin and Vera's mom set up an altar. Jin wonders why Vera killed herself, but her mom reveals Vera's struggles with her work and disinterest in religion. After this, Jin receives a metallic helmet from Vera's mom, who is revealed to be Wenji. In 1966, young Wenji observes the satellite's effect on birds, which kills them. In the present, Jin tries the helmet and enters a hyper-realistic virtual reality game. She encounters a temple and a rising sun. As soon as the sun rises, it sets everything on fire and she also sees a charred body before removing the helmet in distress. Meanwhile, Clarence sees a photo of a person wearing the same helmet and gets suspicious. He investigates the helmet's significance, while Wade expresses keen interest, believing it holds answers. Augie and Saul discuss the mysterious woman's message and the serial box decoder rings age. As midnight approaches, they witness stars blinking in the sky, shocking them. In 1966, Wenji learns about the Red Coast Project's true purpose for communication, not weaponry. Augie and Saul realize the blinking stars convey a numerical code, matching the numbers Augie sees. Meanwhile, Clarence and Wade also see the blinking stars and consider them as a sign of their enemies. In the present, Saul visits Vera's mother, Wenji, who notices his interest in the altar. Wenji questions Saul about his theory regarding the blinking stars. He speculates it could be a deep fake, as global satellites didn't detect anything, but he's unsure who orchestrated it. Meanwhile, Augie prepares for the first experiments on her revolutionary work. Amidst discussions about the blinking stars, Augie focuses on the countdown indicating she has limited time. She initiates the test successfully, but the countdown continues, prompting her to halt the experiment. As she shuts it down, the numbers vanish. Clarence observes her, offering to explain why the stars flickered for her, catching her attention. In 1968, Wenji listens to China's greeting message sent into space. Concerned about the signal's strength, she questions Yang about the duration of transmission and other countries' activities. Realizing their signal's weakness, she suggests contacting an American scientist, despite the potential consequences. As Wenji listens to the static during her shift, Yang brings her the response from the American scientist. Excitedly, she sketches out a map illustrating how they received a message after the Americans did. She explains her plan to boost their signal using the sun, making their message stronger. Eager to present her idea to the commissioner, Wenji is dismayed when Yang takes credit for the concept. 
Call to the commissioner's office to verify Yang's calculations, she realizes she's been betrayed. She witnesses Yang being scolded for suggesting to aim the transmission at the sun, as it is a symbol contrary to their political beliefs. Later, in the control room, Wenji subtly adjusts the satellite's direction during a test transmission without anyone noticing. Meanwhile, Clarence questions Augie about Mike Evans, revealing that scientists who have seen the countdown have either quit their work or taken drastic measures. Augie watches footage from the alley, noticing her cigarette lighting up, indicating someone was there but was erased from the video. Then we see Jin who puts the helmet on again and encounters a man and a young child. The man claims to be the Count of the West, insisting that their interaction is not a game. He hopes Jin is the hero of their world and addresses her as Copernicus. He calls the young girl follower. The Count says they must see the Emperor because it's a chaotic time, and if they don't solve the riddle, their whole civilization will be destroyed. While he talks, a star moves quickly, and then the sun starts rising. They hide behind a rock for shade, but there's only enough space for two people. The Count pushes follower into the sun, where she takes off her coat and lies down. She dries out in the sun, and when it sets, he wraps her up, hoping she can survive if rehydrated. After this, Jin removes the helmet. Jin shares her experience with Jack and Jack thinks the game might be a test version, but Jin says it's too advanced. He puts it on and finds the scenery crazy. The game host appears and kills him for not being invited. When he takes off the helmet, he says the technology is too advanced. Jin suggests they stop playing since Vera played it before and she died, but soon she puts the helmet back on. Unknown to them, Clarence is listening to their conversation through Jin's phone. Clarence cleans debris from his wife's grave. It's her birthday, and he brings a cupcake, placing it on the grave. A woman nearby says she brings her dad cake on his birthday. One mistake, and he was gone. She asks about Clarence's wife, who died of cancer. Her father, she says, was shot in the head. Clarence apologizes, feeling uneasy. The woman leaves, but Clarence realizes that the grave she visited was for a child who died in 1909. Then, we see Jack who arrives home to find a case with his name on it. Inside is a helmet and an invitation to play. His first level is set in England, and he's dressed in old-fashioned clothes. When a man and child approach him, Jack punches the man but hurts his hand. The man introduces himself as Sir Thomas More and advises Jack to choose a better name. Jack punches him again, causing the child, follower, to wince. In his classroom, Will talks to his students about multiple universes. His phone rings, showing missed calls from his doctor. Later, he meets with the doctor, and his expression shows distress as he leaves the hospital. Will and Jack meet up, and Jack excitedly talks about the game while Will reveals he has stage 4 pancreatic cancer with only a few months left. Jack refuses to accept it, promising to find the best doctors to fight it. Will feels it's too late but Jack encourages him not to give up, recalling instances where Will gave up on things, including physics, and asking Jin out. Then, we see Jin who plays the game in bed, finding herself inside a palace. The Count of the West predicts salvation, claiming to predict the sun's movements. Jin doubts its scientific validity, but the Count instructs her to speed up time by putting her hand on the ground until stability arrives in eight days. The Emperor orders the followers to be rehydrated, and they emerge from the water as fully formed people. Jin also tosses follower's body into the water, and she returns, thanking Jin. However, Jin sees the sun moving away, indicating instability. Suddenly, winds blow fiercely, and follower turns to dust, leaving Jin devastated. The game's host appears and acknowledges that Jin didn't save them and she demonstrated that science is more reliable than mysticism. In the next level, science must triumph over superstition. Meanwhile, a man in a control booth observes Jin's gameplay. Meanwhile, Clarence updates Wade on Evans, mentioning that in 1977, researchers detected a signal that seemed like an attempt at communication. Surprisingly, the only site besides Ohio State that picked up the signal was in China, where Evans happened to be at the time. In 1977, Wenji encounters a younger Evans in fields of newly planted trees. He also possesses a copy of Silent Spring. While Wenji and Yang are scouting for a new radio station location, Evans is there, concerned about saving a bird. Before departing, Wenji quotes Silent Spring to Evans, emphasizing the interconnectedness of all life forms. Later, Wenji discusses with Yang that the first site is preferable, but the commissioner has chosen the second site, which would destroy Evans' conservation efforts. Yang reveals that the second site also houses a labor camp where the girl responsible for Wenji's father's death is imprisoned. However, despite losing an arm in the prison, the girl refuses to show remorse, intensifying Wenji's anger. That night, Wenji receives a message instructing her not to reply, as responding would lead to their world's conquest. Ignoring the warning, Wenji redirects the satellite toward the sun and sends a message inviting the sender to come and conquer their world, offering her assistance in the process. Clarence travels to Switzerland to meet with scientists at CERN after another scientist dies, bringing the total to 32. 
This time, the scientist was found dead with his head in a tub, and inside his safe, there's one of the game helmets. Augie, Jin, Saul, Jack, and Will gather to discuss the recent scientist's death. Will asks Augie about the mysterious numbers, but she reveals they're gone, along with her career. Jack offers snacks to his friends, but Will stays behind to have a private conversation with Jin. Will confesses that he's quitting teaching, expressing a desire for more adventure in life, like exploring Patagonia. Jin responds with a hopeful someday, unaware of Will's limited time due to his undisclosed cancer. Meanwhile, Augie discovers Jack's helmet in his bedroom and tries it on, only to meet a quick demise in the game. Confronting Jack downstairs, Augie learns that both Jin and Jack have been playing the game. Even though she's unsure and worried, they start looking closely at the game, especially at the character followers' request for help and the strange way three sons move in the game. Augie can't believe that they would engage in the same game that Vera was involved in before her death. Jack explains he found the helmet at home with no signs of forced entry, leading Augie to suspect someone tampered with the video footage, similar to the mysterious woman who warned her about the blinking stars. Saul realizes that the helmet has the power to control every aspect of one's life, suggesting Vera may not have been in her right mind when she took her own life. After this, they agree to refrain from playing the game further. But soon, they're back to playing, this time over video chat. Jin explains they need to solve the mystery of the suns and shares her research with Jack. Meanwhile, Clarence hacks into their video feed and monitors their conversation. Jin thinks there's no pattern, but she needs Jack's help, who goes by the name Francis Bacon in the game. They enter the game and find themselves in England once more. Follower greets them, hoping they'll save their world. She recalls each time they failed to save her. Inside the church, Pope Gregory is about to make a decision regarding Aristotle and Galileo's proposal. Jin argues her case, suggesting that the planet is part of a three-body star system, leading to the recurring chaotic eras. The other player's object, and the Pope sentences Jin to burn. However, the world starts burning again. During this, Follower arrives on a burning horse, revealing three suns in the sky. Meanwhile, Jack rescues Jin, and they witness everyone burning in molten lava. They realize they're not dead because their theory was correct. The game host appears, explaining that Civilization 152 was destroyed by a three-star day, but they will advance to the next level as they have successfully solved the puzzle. Then, we see Wade asks about the helmet, and Clarence shares what he overheard from Jin and Jack's conversation. The helmets have a biometric retinal scanner, meaning that while you're in the game, someone else is controlling your actions. Jin exits the game to find her boyfriend, Raj Varma, watching her. He's aware of her nerves about meeting his parents and advises her to avoid too much science talk. Raj's father shares a story about his near-death experience fighting Pakistani soldiers, highlighting the importance of playing dead to survive. The family applauds Jin for getting through dinner. Meanwhile, Jack and Saul visit Will after his surgery. Still feeling groggy, Will recounts his conversation with his cancer, suggesting that it's merely trying to find a home for itself and its offspring. Then, he jokes about Jack's non-existent hat. Augie's colleague expresses frustration as their lab has been shut down. After this, Augie attempts to restart the project alone, and the numbers reappear. Concerned, she shuts down the project again and calls Saul. She believes she knows why scientists are taking their own lives and reveals that it's because of the countdown. Jin arrives at Jack's house, eager to show him what happens in level 3 of the game. They find themselves in Xanadu, facing the challenge of a three-star system with unpredictable movements, known as the three-body problem. Follower warns them that time is running out and the world will soon face its end. Presented to Khan, Jin, and Jack witness Newton and Turing proposing a theory to calculate the sun's movement using a human abacus made of soldiers. Despite Khan's initial skepticism, they succeed in finding a solution. Khan orders them to dehydrate for eight months and three days. As time progresses, they witness what seems like a stable era, but Jin predicts it won't last. Khan orders them to be boiled alive, but Jin manipulates time to align with the gravitational force of all three suns, causing everything to float into the sky, including Follower. Jin realizes that their mission in the game is to find a way for people to survive the chaos. The game host congratulates them on discovering their true purpose and advances them to level 4. Meanwhile, the man in the control room presents his findings to Evans, who instructs him to call Jin and Jack for the London Summit. He then resumes reading Hansel and Gretel to someone on the other end, engaging in a discussion about humanity and fear, with the goal of teaching humans about fear once more. Meanwhile, Jin receives a mysterious package inviting her to an address, and Jack receives the same. They meet the mysterious woman, who praises them for their progress in the game and assures them that level 4 holds the answers they seek. Entering the game, they encounter Follower and the game host, who reveal that there is no solution to the three-body problem. Follower demonstrates the rise and fall of civilizations due to their planet's eventual destruction, prompting the inhabitants to seek a new home on Earth. Jin decides to stay and learn more, while Jack, skeptical of the situation, chooses to leave. 
Back at Jack's home, Clarence takes pictures of him while his team monitors Jin. Suddenly, Jack's Wi-Fi is turned off, so he searches for a signal. During this, the mysterious woman confronts him in his bedroom and fatally wounds him with a dagger, unseen by Clarence outside. Back in London in 1982, Wenji meets Evans at a restaurant. She's now a professor, but he's still dealing with problems. Wenji wants to talk to him about something she did earlier. In the present, Will is in the hospital, waiting for Jack but Saul comes instead and brings bad news. Meanwhile, Augie and Jin are called by Clarence and Wade and they watch security footage from Jack's apartment. They're disturbed seeing their friend being attacked. Wade and Clarence explain that the attacker got past 18 cameras at Jack's house. They mention Vera had five smart people working with her before she died. Now, the attacker wants Augie to stop her work. Then, Clarence and Wade ask Jin to work for them and find more information about the attacker. Jin reveals she tried to convince Jack to stop talking about the Sandi. She believes they're real, and Augie agrees. However, Augie also says they've been fighting for their whole lives, and they won't stop now. Then, Clarence updates Wade on Evan's whereabouts and it is revealed that he's aboard a ship near Alexandria. However, Wade decides to hold off on taking action for now. On the ship, named Judgment Day, Evans interacts with the passengers, a diverse group of people. A young girl asks if they'll meet their lord, and Evans replies that it's up to their lord. He mentions they can perform miracles. Later, Felix presents him with a list of potential candidates for the summit. In his office, Evans communicates with a disembodied voice, discussing the summit and their enemy's awareness of it. Despite the threat, the voice assures protection to Evans. Meanwhile, Clarence multitasks, observing his son playing video games while he works. He inquires about his son's job search, but his son insists he's an entrepreneur. During this, Clarence glances at the memorial for his late wife and becomes sad. Saul and Will visit Jack's home to select a suit for his funeral. While going through his belongings, they stumble upon mementos from his childhood, including photographs. Jin insists to Wade that she's a scientist, not a spy but Clarence assures her they'll monitor her activities and asks her to gather information for them. He advises her to pack for several days in case it's unsafe for her to return home. Then, Jin questions if they believe these people are connected to aliens, which they confirm. Later, Jin heads to the summit location, with Wade instructing her not to take her phone inside. Meanwhile, Evans reads Little Red Riding Hood to the voice, who questions why the wolf deceives the grandmother. The voice ponders why the wolf would communicate with her if his intention was to eat her. Evans explains it's to conceal his true motives, prompting the voice to inquire if they ever hide their intentions. Although Evans refers to their enemies as pests, the voice doesn't grasp the metaphor as their adversaries are human. Evans asks if they lie, but the voice denies it. When the voice questions if they lie, Evans acknowledges that everyone does, causing concern. Then, the voice expresses a desire to speak with the wolf from the story, leading Evans to clarify that the tale is fictional. The voice realizes the story portrays a lie, prompting a moment of silence before it admits understanding. Evans emphasizes their need for him to facilitate understanding, but the voice asserts they cannot coexist with liars, revealing fear of them before falling silent. Meanwhile, Wade monitors Jin's car as she heads towards the summit's undisclosed location in a remote area. Members of the group observing her require Jin to undergo a retinal scan for entry. She is then taken to the summit's venue, where the driver reassures her that they will all be protected by their lord. Upon arrival, Jin receives a pin and enters a large greenhouse where the summit is being held. Tatiana, also known as the mysterious woman from the beginning, expresses condolences for Jin's loss and shares her anticipation for obtaining answers. She mentions the protection of their lord and announces the arrival of their founder. During this, Wade questions Clarence about how Evans managed to leave the boat without detection, but Clarence highlights that Tatiana's movements also went unnoticed by security cameras. Their founder is introduced, and Jin is astonished to discover that it is Dr. Yi Wenji, who greets Jin before taking the stage. Wade and Clarence are astounded, realizing that their perceptions have been manipulated by an unknown force. Wenji addresses the crowd, recounting the hardships she endured in her youth and the ongoing struggles she witnessed. Despite the challenges, she believes in the existence of the Sandi, who can perform miracles even in their chaotic world. She urges everyone to prepare for the Sandi's arrival, which is expected in 400 years. After this, Wenji expresses gratitude to Evans for his assistance. However, their gathering is interrupted by a military assault team storming the building. Despite the chaos, Wenji instructs her followers to remain calm and submit to the soldiers, believing it to be the will of their lord. Soldiers detain Jin and others, but Tatiana intervenes, sparking a violent confrontation. In the commotion, Clarence shoots Tatiana to protect Jin. Wenji observes this as Jin escapes with Clarence. Later, bodies are removed from the scene as Clarence assures Jin and Augie of their safety. Meanwhile, Tatiana manages to flee through the nearby foliage. Will returns home and reflects on his friendship with Jack, placing a reminder of their time together on a shelf. 
he then settles in with a book of fairy tales, which was a gift from Jin. Meanwhile, in the ambulance, Jin receives a call from Will, who expresses concern for her well-being. She reassures him and mentions being taken to a safe location, where she plans to explain recent events. Will proposes a gathering at a cottage after the funeral, suggesting they invite Raj as well, but Jin declines, preferring it to be just the two of them. In 1982, Evans takes Wenji on a helicopter ride to a boat in the ocean, which houses the old satellite known as the Judgment Day. He assures her that there will be no interference this time, having arranged everything for her. Evans presents a computer filled with messages from their counterparts, emphasizing Wenji's significance to them. Grateful for her efforts, Evans expresses hope for the future and shares a tender moment with Wenji. In the present, Wade leads Wenji into a room crowded with people. He mentions their awareness of Judgment Day. Wenji responds calmly, stating that he only caught her because it was permitted by their counterparts. She warns them about the capabilities of these entities, emphasizing their inevitable arrival and the futility of resistance. However, she hints at the positive impact their arrival will have, leaving Wade and the others unsettled by her cryptic words. We see Thomas Wade recruiting Jin's boyfriend, Raj Sharma, for a task. Then, we shift back to Yuenji, who is still in custody and being interrogated by Clarence. She believes that since her capture was allowed by her superiors, she no longer poses a threat with her knowledge. Clarence seeks to understand why she reached out to the aliens. Wenji explains that she did so because she believes human civilization is unable to solve its own problems. During their conversation, several key details emerge. It's revealed that Mike Evans is Vera Yi's biological father, and the Sani possess a method of communication with their followers on Earth. It is also revealed that Evans spends most of his time on a ship, raising questions about his activities and potential communication methods with the Sani. Augie and Jin are relocated to a secure location and guarded by undercover police officers. However, Given the Sani's capabilities, this may not be sufficient protection. Wade and Clarence discuss their next steps regarding Evans and Wenji. They acknowledge the need for intelligence to formulate a plan, given the 400-year timeline they have. Clarence suspects that Evans may be documenting his communications with the Sani aboard the Judgment Day. They must find a way to neutralize the individuals on the ship without compromising the data they seek, which presents challenges as conventional methods risk damaging the crucial information stored on the ship's systems. Interestingly, since the Sani learned about lies, they've distanced themselves from their human allies. Mike Evans tries to act normal but the Sani haven't communicated with him since. He remains convinced that everything is part of the Sani's grand design. After this, Clarence pays a visit to Augie at the safe house and urges her to resume her nanofiber research. He sees it as crucial for his plan to obtain data from the Judgment Day, a ship that recently passed through the Panama Canal Authority. However, when Augie restarts the nanofiber manufacturing machines, nothing happens. The numbers indicating the countdown failed to reappear. Clarence speculates that perhaps the Lord has stopped protecting his people. Then, we learn that Jack has left Will a large sum of money in his will. Saul advises Will to seek treatment for his illness, but Will prefers not to undergo medical procedures in his final months. Wade's team, led by Jin's boyfriend Raj, prepares nanofibers to stretch across the canal where the Judgment Day will pass. This triggers a deadly event, as Augie's nanofibers slice the ship and everyone on board, including children, to pieces. Mike Evans dies in the attack while holding a hard drive containing his communication with the Sandi. The hard drive is initially encrypted with quantum encryption, making it impossible to crack using the usual methods. However, it suddenly opens up, allowing Clarence and his analyst to access its contents. Inside, they find a file named Softens, which contains over 100 million gigabytes of data. Yi Wenji remains in custody, and Wade takes the opportunity to boast about their recent success. However, Wenji remains steadfast in her belief that everything is unfolding as planned by the Sani. Wade gives her a recording of the conversation where Mike Evans taught the Sani about human deception. Wenji realizes that this conversation may have altered Sani's perception of humans, causing them to become fearful and potentially hostile. After this, Jin and Thomas Wade are invited to put on VR helmets once again to learn more from the Sani. They are introduced to softens, which are particle-sized sentient supercomputers. The Sani have realized that humanity will advance beyond them in the 400 years it will take for their fleet to reach Earth. To prevent this, they created four softens, two of which remain with them, while the other two were sent to Earth to spy on humans and disrupt their scientific progress. These softens are behind the suicides of scientists, as they have the ability to manipulate what people see and disrupt scientific endeavors, causing chaos and preventing advancements. They aim to instill fear in humans and ensure that they cannot surpass the Sani in technology and science before their arrival. The softens hijack screens worldwide to deliver a message. You are bugs. Even Yi Wenji is alarmed by this revelation. One of the softens envelops the world, creating an ominous all-seeing eye, providing undeniable proof of the Sani's existence. With the revelation that the Sani are on their way, panic spreads worldwide. People react by committing suicide, displaying erratic behavior, and forming religious cults devoted to the Sani. Despite the aliens' arrival being 400 years away, the fear instilled by the softens and the Ewer Bugs message has already taken hold. Humanity realizes the need to prepare for a potential conflict. 
Thomas Wade assembles a team of scientists, including Jin, to create a reconnaissance probe to spy on the Sani, similar to how they are being observed by the Sofans. Jin's strategy involves launching a probe using nuclear pulse propulsion to infiltrate the interstellar fleet. The news about Will's cancer is finally revealed to Jin. They share a touching moment together, sailing paper boats on the beach. We later see Will reading a book of fairy tales, hinting at its importance. Meanwhile, Augie is struggling to cope after the events of Judgment Day. She's turned to heavy drinking every night, unable to shake off the guilt. Jin isn't happy about Raj's decision to work for Wade either, but Raj argues that Jin is doing the same thing. Jin insists it's not the same because her work hasn't caused harm to anyone. Will and Saul manage to persuade Augie to meet with Wade. They trust Jin's judgment and believe she wouldn't involve them in anything harmful. Wade reveals an intriguing plan for his probe and explains that he doesn't want to send a camera into space, instead, he intends to send an actual human being. Then, Jin pays a visit to Yi Wenji while she's still in custody at the police station. Jin questions Wenji's decision to act on behalf of all humanity that day. Despite everything, Wenji's faith in her lord seems to have been shaken by the Yu or Bugs message. She blames humanity once again, believing that our capacity for darkness and deception drove the Sani away. When Clarence finally releases Wenji, he assigns someone to keep an eye on her. Wenji returns home and pleads with the Sani to listen to her, hoping that she still has some ideas that could shape the impending conflict between the Sani and humanity, or perhaps prevent it altogether. Meanwhile, inspired by the stars our destination program, Will decides to use the money he received from Jack's estate to buy a star. Will spends a large sum of money to buy a star for Jin, showing his gesture of affection and generosity. Later, he shows Saul the star in the sky but then collapses, ending up in the hospital where he's placed in critical care unit. During this, Jin receives a large box containing the certificate and documents for her star, and she's puzzled as to who would send it to her, suspecting it might be a prank. After this, Jin and Wade continue with their project titled The Staircase Project, aiming to send a human brain into space. Their team has successfully hibernated and revived a chimp, but it immediately falls ill afterward. Realizing the challenges of sending a person, Wade proposes sending a human brain, anticipating the Sani's interest. The catch is they need someone willing to sacrifice their life and possess high intelligence. Will agrees to undergo the process, despite Jin's attempts to stop him. However, when asked to sign a document pledging loyalty to humanity, Will refuses. He questions why he should pledge allegiance to humanity when the Sani might offer a better future. Will's refusal to sign the oath convinces Wade that he's the ideal candidate for the project. With Will's lack of loyalty to humanity, he could be valuable in infiltrating the Sani. Wade sees the potential for Will to be more useful to them if he doesn't pledge allegiance to humankind. Kind. As Will prepares for the final process in euthanasia, he's given five prompts to confirm his consent. Despite Saul's attempts to persuade him otherwise, Will remains steadfast in his decision. He understands the risks, including the possibility of enduring immense suffering at the hands of the Santi. Before Will passes away, Wade informs Jin that he bought her the star. Rushing to the hospital, Jin arrives too late to see Will alive. Meanwhile, Augie decides to cut ties with Wade and her boss, unwilling to have her research controlled by individuals like them. She leaks all her specifications and information to the world, ensuring that anyone capable can access it. Augie then boards a flight to an undisclosed location. Among the Oxford Five members, Saul stands out for having a potentially important role ahead. It seems he might become a wallfacer, a key figure in confronting the Sunny threat. We see Wade discussing the wallfacer project, followed by a scene reminiscent of a moment from the dark forest where Yi Wenji interacts with Saul in a graveyard. During their conversation, Wenji shares a joke with a hidden message, hinting at a way for humans to resist the Sani. This could provide Saul with a crucial clue to help humanity in the future. Although it's too late to change past decisions, Wenji's talk with Saul offers hope for the future. As Wenji prepares to end her life, Tatiana, chosen by the Sani, joins her for their final moments together. Saul has a brief encounter with a woman named Nora, but their night takes a tragic turn when they witness a sudden car crash that kills Nora. Soon after, Saul faces Clarence, who questions his involvement with Yi Wenji before her recent demise in China. As they speak, an attempt is made on Saul's life, revealing that the earlier car crash was not accidental but orchestrated to harm him. Protected by a bulletproof jacket provided by Clarence, Saul accompanies him to a ceremony at the Planetary Defense Council. Here, the Secretary General unveils the Wallfacer Project, which aims to counter the influence of the Sofans. These Wallfacers, including Saul, are tasked with devising strategies to outsmart the Sofans, as they cannot read human thoughts. The Wallfacers, including Saul, are given extensive resources and authority to devise secretive plans to outsmart the Sofans. They must keep their strategies hidden from everyone, even if they seem strange or incomprehensible. Saul is surprised by this decision and refuses the role, but the project relies on individuals making unconventional statements to confuse the enemy. The Wallfacers are chosen because they can deceive others, which is a key aspect of the project. Despite Saul's refusal, the general suspects he may already be working on his plan. Moments after leaving the building, 
Saul survives an assassination attempt due to his bulletproof attire. Meanwhile, Jin requests Wade to include seed packets in the probe with Will's brain, but he declines, citing the need to minimize Wade. Jin threatens to quit, but Wade knows she won't if it means continuing her research. Later, she joins Wade to oversee the launch of the staircase project. Meanwhile, Clarence alerts Wade about the attack on Saul and urges him to ensure it doesn't recur. Due to the attack, Saul's got a broken rib, but Clarence is sticking close to protect him. Then, Saul meets the guy who shot him, who's pretty intense about being a soldier for some higher cause. Even though Saul turned down the wallfacer role, everyone treats him like he's still one. The Secretary General says Saul has to figure out why he was picked. No one knows what's really going on in his head, so his rejection might just be part of his plan. The Sani tried to kill him twice already, so they must see him as a threat. Now, instead of diving into his wallfacer duties, Saul supports Jin at the launch of the staircase project. During this, Jin admits to Raj that she loved Will, but their relationship seems to be over. Saul tells Jin he hopes he finds someone who loves him like Will loved her but Jin thinks someone already does. As for Augie, she's overseas using her research to help folks access clean water. Unfortunately, the staircase project faces a setback when the probe carrying Will's brain veers off course in space, potentially ending up anywhere. However, it is revealed that Wade agreed to include the seeds in the probe. On Wade's flight back home, he gets a visit from Sofan, who ominously warns him of their impending invasion and promises him a role in it. They suggest that even though Wade plans to enter hibernation, they will manipulate his perceptions. Tatiana also receives a message from the Sani, hinting at a greater mission for her. Feeling down about recent events, Jin and Saul are taken by Clarence for a drive. He brings them to a place filled with cicadas and reminds them that humans have struggled to eradicate bugs for centuries. Despite their small size, bugs are resilient. Then, Clarence suggests that maybe humans are more formidable than the Sani think. 